A defense investigator working on behalf of the man accused of murdering four Idaho college students says one of the surviving roommates could help clear the suspect of the crime. A subpoena obtained by Fox states the investigator believes the surviving roommate heard or saw something that would prove Brian Koberger did not commit the crime. The defense wants that roommate to appear in court for Koberger's preliminary hearing, which is a two-day hearing that starts June 28th. If she refuses, the court filing does say that she could be fined $500 or 25 days in jail. I do want to bring in a friend of the show here, Joshua Ritter, a criminal defense attorney in L.A. and former federal prosecutor to talk more about this here. Thank you so much for taking the time here to join us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So first off, can you explain this order here, this subpoena, and what it really means overall? Does it hold any sort of value, or is it more just kind of an opinion situation? Well, no, usually a subpoena has a lot of teeth. And so if, if the jurisdictional issues related to that subpoena are on sound legal footing, then yeah, she's, she's got an issue. She's going to have to show up to court. And, you know, this is how our court system works. I understand that we don't want to re-victimize people uh, unnecessarily, and we don't want to put people through things that they don't need to be put through again. But, you know, this is how we handle things in this country is that you have to be able to call witnesses, especially when a defendant is facing um, charges this serious, they have to be able to mount a defense. And so if they feel that somehow she has exculpatory evidence that she could testify to, I think a judge will compel her. The issue is going to come down to is their proper jurisdictional um, uh, heft behind this because if there was some issue about where she was subpoenaed, where she domiciled at, who has jurisdiction. So do we have any idea just based on the filing itself uh, what she might have heard, what she might have saw? No, that's a great, really great question. You know, when the affidavit was released, we know that one of the survivors uh, saw a masked man leaving. And that that was some of the most startling evidence that we had heard about. It's unclear as to what this witness may have seen um, or heard. Uh, it, you know, it could be something as simple as I saw a man, but but she described him as being six foot six, which doesn't match the description. Or, you know, perhaps she heard a voice that somehow doesn't match. Or it could all come down to timing, perhaps the, when she says she heard these things somehow doesn't line up with the police investigation narrative and that the defense feels that that will somehow poke some holes in it. But we certainly haven't heard anything earth shattering uh, so far that would lead us to believe why this witness would be so important to the defense. Tell me how a preliminary hearing like this works. Are we going to hear testimony and things of that nature? I would assume based on this we would. And the fact that it's slated to take place over two days. Is that normal? That is normal. And in a case of this seriousness and magnitude, I wouldn't be surprised if it took, took much longer. Sometimes you see in murder cases, they could take weeks, uh, quite honestly, when you're dealing with uh, several uh, dead bodies, um, you know, you're going to have to go through the autopsies and everything else. But to answer your question, what a preliminary hearing is, uh, is it's a, a hearing before a judge only. There's no jury and it's a lower standard of proof. So you're not asking to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. You're asking for the judge to find probable cause. And essentially what it's saying is that we're, we're not going to hold this person in custody, this defendant in custody, unless we, we check what the prosecution has to some extent. So it's an opportunity for a judge for the first time to evaluate uh, to a lesser degree the prosecution's evidence to make sure that they do have enough evidence to hold that person and bind them over for trial. So again, it's not about guilt or not guilt. It's more about is there probable cause to allow this person to answer for the charges at a later date. What about the option of uh, doing a grand jury? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I'm, I would be surprised if they didn't pursue that here. Usually in cases that are uh, very serious or very complex or certainly cases that have this much media scrutiny, that's sometimes a better option for the prosecution. What that allows them to do, now we're not dealing with a judge, we're dealing with a grand jury, a group of people, um, and they're going to have evidence presented to them, but it's in a closed proceeding, it's private, uh, and there isn't the... Um, the kind of added pressure of having defense counsel there to cross-examine some of these witnesses. So that same witness that they're concerned about 
wouldn't have to testify under cross examination which might make them feel more comfortable now what the prosecution has to do in that situation is to some extent play both sides of the courtroom and present some exculpatory evidence but it is an option sometimes pursued by prosecuting offices in in cases just like this i would be surprised if it happened here and so several media outlets actually filed uh, with a judge here. They were trying to get a gag order lifted. It sounds like the judge said, no, that's not going to happen. Kind of break down how that played out and whether that was a decision that was or was not expected. Well, I, I will say that the judge has taken a, a pretty extreme view on this gag order. Usually you'll see a gag order in cases like this with a lot of media attention that might only apply to the attorneys involved. But the judge here has extended it beyond that from the, the attorneys, family members, investigators, anybody just kind of ancillarily connected to this case, which you have to understand begins to encroach on people's First Amendment rights. I mean, people have a right to talk about things that are going on in their lives as long as it's not going to somehow affect the integrity of this ongoing investigation. So media outlets, uh, obviously, uh, took some umbrage with this and appealed that to the Idaho Supreme Court that was recently denied by the court. And it's what's interesting is they didn't say that they are denying it on the merits of their argument. They're denying it on the fact that they didn't first go through that original judge to object to it and have a hearing with that original judge. So it's in a way, it's the Supreme Court in Idaho. They're kind of punting, saying, listen, we, we find that you have an issue here, but you have to go through the proper channels first. So we're not going to make a determination on the merits. So I don't think this is the end of this. We might see this back in court in front of that judge who actually made the, the gag order ruling to hear some more about what are her reasons behind it. All right, Joshua Ritter there, former federal prosecutor and criminal defense attorney currently there in L.A. Anything you want to add about all of this before I let you go? It's just such an interesting case because to one extent, there's so much kind of attention surrounding it um, because because of the intrigue of it, because of the nightmare situation of it. So we're we're kind of getting these little drips here and there. But then at the same time, you would hope that we would have a little bit more transparency allowed by the judge because of the interest in this, because otherwise we're just going to have a bunch of speculation and you, you, people like you and I doing a bunch of guesswork until we actually get some solid facts as to what's going on. That sounds about right. All right, Joshua Ritter, thank you so much for taking the time here to join us, and I'm sure we'll be bringing you again uh, very soon. Thank you for having me.